Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Timothy Lee, and I'm a research analyst at Red Cloud Securities. I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on gold and copper exploration and development today. We will hear from Marshall Koval, CEO, and Scott Hicks, VP Corporate Development of Lumina Gold Corporation. During today's webinar, they will provide an overview and outlook, and then we will take questions. You can type your questions into the chat box at any time, and we will get to as many as we can. Before we kick things off, first we need to discuss some fine print uh, during this Lumina Gold webinar. Forward-looking statements may be made. I would direct listeners to the company's forward-looking statements disclosure outlined on page two of the Lumina corporate presentation, and that can be found on the company's website, luminagold.com. For Red Cloud Securities, Inc., I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note that this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. And please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on Lumina. So we have Lumina Gold presenting today. The company is focused on the Congrejos Gold Copper Project in Ecuador, which hosts a large resource and is advancing through development. The company just announced a major milestone yesterday afternoon. I don't want to steal their thunder. Uh, so with that, I now turn it over to Marshall and Scott to update our audience on the company. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, let's get our uh, presentation up. There you go. So Lumina Gold, if you recall, we have the Congrejos project in southwest um, Ecuador, about 40 miles from the port of Bolivar, where concentrates would be shipped from. The project is, we've been involved in the project since 2014, and we started with no resource estimate. It was originally discovered by Newmont. Fast forward through several iterations and two PEAs and the PFS, um, we have 20 million ounces of gold in all resource categories and about 2.5 uh, billion pounds of copper. So we put out a PEA in 2020, 2020 and it showed good economics and, and we proceeded with the PFS. It took us about 18 months to kind of go through all of the um, infill drilling, the, the drilling related to step out drilling to expand uh, the Gran Bestia deposit primarily, and then also the geotech pit slope work and a whole host of other engineering uh, geotechnical studies and other engineering studies. And the culmination of that was um, this PFS. So right now, if we look at Congrejos today, it's the 26th uh, largest uh, gold asset globally in all res by resource in all categories, production, exploration, development. It's the largest primary gold deposit in Ecuador. Um, we have 16.8 million ounces of gold and 2.2 billion pounds of copper in the indicated category. That was the basis of the resource that was used to develop um, the uh, reserve that we state in the PFS. And let me just kind of run you through the PFS summary. The large uh, production profile of 371,000 ounces of gold a year on average and 41 million pounds of copper. And if you look at it on a gold equivalent basis, that's uh, 469,000 ounces of gold and uh, well over 500,000 ounces of gold in certain years. As a matter of fact, one year when we get into the high grade core, it spits out about uh, 700,000 ounces of gold. It's got a long lifetime, 26 uh, year mine life, low cost, $671 an ounce ASIC net of byproduct copper credit. And that, at $1,650 gold and a 5% uh, percent discount rate on NPV, it gives us a $2.2 billion NPV. And if you look at the 20% up case on gold up to 1980, which is more or less today's price, you get 3.5 billion NPV. And, you know, Ecuador has been an emerging jurisdiction. We started there in 2014 and, and you fast forward to today and you've got Lundin Gold producing over 400,000 ounces of gold a year. You've got the Mirador Copper Mine um, that's producing uh, copper at about 60,000 ton per day throughput. 
And both these projects are around a billion dollar initial capital. So um, just taking a look at, um, you know, a snapshot of the corporate overview, Ross Beatty has 20.8%. Uh, He's the founder of our group, uh, key shareholder. Uh, Ecuadorian Entrepreneurial Group have 18.1%, uh, management and the board about 9%, and Route 1 at 6.7%. Uh, They're a diversified investment fund in California. Um, right now, our market cap is about um, $225 million. The last I looked today, fully diluted 411 million shares, issued an outstanding 379 million shares. And we have coverage by Red Cloud, Haywood, and Raymond James. And you can see our share price um, over the last 52 weeks. We're, we're moving back up towards uh, our high of 52 weeks. A lot of that is on the back of anticipation of the PFS and then the PFS results. If you look at Ecuador, um, like I mentioned earlier, it's really come a long way since we entered in 2014. At that time, it had sort of a oil uh, fiscal regime. It had a windfall profit tax, had punitive royalties. And basically, that's all moved to where Ecuador is now competitive with its neighbors, uh, Peru and Ecuador on a fiscal regime, uh, excuse me, Peru and Chile on a fiscal regime. The regulatory regime has been improved. And that led to, uh, you know, Fruta being able to be uh, put into production in 2019 in Mirador. There's uh, three other smaller projects that are uh, ready for construction, Curipamba, La Plata, and Loma Larga. And then you've got Congreos, Cascabel, and um, Luminex, our sister company, Condor Project, that we've completed a PEA. They're on the stage towards development. In the upper right-hand side here, you can see how um, exports, a matter of fact, this morning, I just got a um, note from Ecuador that basically said that mining uh, in March surpassed uh, banana exports as the largest uh, export, as the third largest export in the country. First you have petroleum, then you have shrimp farming and then mining and then bananas. So it's becoming more of a critical component of uh, Ecuador uh, going forward, Ecuador's economy going forward. And from a geologic perspective, it's really one of the last uh, systematically explored uh, regions in Latin America and the world so the potential for discovery of more copper and gold deposits is, is pretty high in Ecuador. And the Fraser Institute is ranked at 24th out of 84 global um, jurisdictions in 2021 as far as favorability towards mining. The, the Congreos project is, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, close to the Porto Bolivar. It's about 40 kilometers in a direct line. We've got power grid into the area. We, uh, for the PFS, we'd have to put a, a transmission line in about 17 kilometers. We're close to the Port of Bolivar right now. <clears throat> Mirador is shipping their concentrates from, from the east side of the country all the way to Port of Bolivar, about 350 kilometers. We've got good infrastructure, paved roads into the area. Um, there's ample water in the area. We're employing uh, dry stack tailings as part of the project design to recycle about 80% of the water. From an Andean perspective, it's low elevation. The highest point on the project is about 1,350 feet. And there's, or meters, sorry. And there's um, no community um, directly on the project. The closest community is about seven kilometers away. We have good relations with that community. Um, Scott, why don't you run with this a little bit and then I'll, I'll come back in. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, how we position this company right now and, you know, it's very easy to say it's a, it's a large deposit, but, you know, for context of, of all the gold projects in the world, this is the 26th largest now by contained gold producing or development. So, you know, it's very large scale. It's the 13th largest undeveloped project by production capacity. Um, if you look at our reserve grade, you know, it's about 0.71 grams per ton gold equivalent, or if you flipped it into copper, equivalent about 0.46. So you know, we think of this as akin to a larger copper porphyry project that really is, you know, it's an exercise in efficiency and scale. Um, it'd be higher grade than Cobra to Panama, 
higher grade than Mount Milligan, similar grade to Red Chris. So, you know, it's it's in line with a lot of these coastal copper projects that have been built uh, over the last decade here. Um, you know, people ask us, well, how does how do the economics work with the grade? So there's four things that really help. You've got an extremely low strip ratio at the project, about 1.26 uh, to one on the on the new PFS. You've got hydro power costs under seven cents a kilowatt hour. We're very close to infrastructure, as Marshall was showing you, and you know economies of scale. Eventually, this is going to be an eighty thousand ton per day operation. So that you can see the co cash costs kind of fall as we ramp up through through the first uh, you know four to seven years there in at the project. Um, capex, it's about nine hundred twenty five million dollars before VAT. Uh, you know, it's about eighty million dollars of VAT there that you would you would uh, spend as well and, and get refunded once you're in production. Um, this is a little bit bigger than Fruta, a little bit smaller than Mirador, the two large scale mines that have been built in the country so far. Um, you know, how advances the project? The PFS really allows us to take it to the next two steps here, which is an investment protection agreement with the government, as well as uh, commencing the permitting process now that we have the infrastructure locked down. So we're looking forward to getting going on those things uh, immediately. These are just the uh, the two ultimate pits uh, you can see here uh, from the PFS. You know, the deposit itself is still open at Congreos to the southwest. It's still open to the north and northwest at uh, Gran Bestia. Um, you know, obviously we have a lot of material here in the resource. So, you know, the current focus is really not going to be on expanding this, but, uh, you know, it is open in several directions still. Um, this is just a cross section here. And for those of you who followed it for a little bit, uh, you know, the main difference would be we've expanded now over the Grand Bestia uh, ridge line off to the, the left side of this figure here um, and, you know, really brought in most of our resource expansion in, in that portion. We also expanded a little bit to the southwest to Congrejos, um, but uh, these are the two. Uh, pits now. So you can see the blue line is the resource and the, the red line is the mine plan there. Um, so we're obviously taking a smaller subset. We're only using about, uh, actually it was about 50% now, I guess, Marshall on the, yeah, uh, the yeah. yeah, in the, in the actual reserves. So, um, obviously if you were to use higher metal price assumptions in your reserves, you would also take more material here. Uh, so, you know, only about 11.6 million ounces of the 20 is going into the mine plant. Uh, so this is just a summary of the reserves here. Um, you know, 660 million tons at kind of 0.55 gold, uh, 0.1 copper, uh, a little bit of silver, but, uh, you know, 80% gold, 20% copper, basically by revenue, the silver is only about, uh, 1%. You know, the mine planning here was done at a very conservative level. So we mine plan these pits between $1,000 and $1,100 gold uh, to generate kind of the, the pit shells. Um, and then obviously uh, that resulted in smaller tonnage going into the mine plant. But, uh, you know, we think that's a, a good conservative way to, to start as a base for the project. Um, just on recoveries here, you know, we we increased the gold recoveries from the last study. So we got up from 82 to 85 percent on the gold um, that goes into a Dore and a copper con. Most of the gold ends up in in the copper con, but uh, there is a bit of a bit of Dore coming out of the project there as well. Uh, the copper recoveries on this are about 79 percent um, with with the flotation circuit um, and for those of you who followed it since the last study, you know, we did get rid of the molybdenum circuit in this um, after a trade-off study. You know, it's an opportunity for the future to include it, but um, you know, we didn't include that in this study. We also um, ended up wasting uh, the sap and saprolite, sap rock and saprolite layer on the surface, um, which which ran grades. So. You know, that's an opportunity to bring in, in the future as well. Um, but we just didn't feel like enough metallurgy work had been done on that specific component to bring it into the PFS um, for, for this stage. So just kind of quickly looking at all the numbers again in, in summary, uh, you know, starting with the capital perhaps in the bottom left, uh, you got 925 million um, to build the 30,000 tons per day. 
We've got an expansion in year four to get you to 60,000 tons per day for another 340 million. So basically all the cash flow from the first three years uh, gets kind of recycled into that expansion. And then you've got a $111 million expansion uh, in year seven to, to the full 80,000 ton per day capacity. Um, you know, that in the first three years, you're kind of about 240,000 ounces gold equivalent. And then you get up to about almost 500,000 ounces of gold equivalent um, for the balance of, of the mine life there. So, you know, it's, it is a large scale project um, and, and obviously the copper adds quite a bit. Um, on the cash cost side, if you want to think about it on an EQ basis, it's about $870 an ounce. If you want to net off the copper, it's about $670 an ounce. But these would be kind of borderline uh, Q1 or first quartile costs in the industry. So uh, it's probably just into Q2 to give you some benchmarking on that. Um, IRR for the project is about 17% at 1650 you know, at today's commodity prices, uh, it's it's about this 23% column that you see here at the 1980 and 450, 450 level. So obviously a lot of torque, uh, you know, you go from $2.2 billion of MPV to $3.5 billion in kind of a spot scenario uh, there. But um, the prices we're running in the base case are, are pretty close to long-term consensus prices right now. Marshall, you want to go through the kind of the infrastructure and mine plan here? Yeah, it's fairly straightforward. So the initial uh, pit that would start is the Congreos uh, pit on the right there. And that would be in through years one through seven. In year eight, you would bring Gran Bestia in. Uh, Congreos is a bit higher grade than Gran Bestia. And then Congreos would be mined out in year 17. And then Gran Bestia would continue on for the balance of uh, the project 26 year mine life. Uh, the waste rock storage facilities directly to the southwest uh, of the Congreos pit. The primary crusher there is sort of magenta, and the uh, the mineralization is conveyed over there to the plant. The plant's in the upper left-hand side. Um, so this is the basic uh, primary components of uh, the mining area. And then off to the north-northwest um, is the tailings. So let's go ahead and flip over to that. So we had the tailings up higher, closer to the plant. And then through um, some engineering work and design work, we decided to move it to a flatter area, a lower elevation, lower rainfall area. So you'll have a tailings filtration plant, which is sort of the pink uh, square in the bottom right there. Um, basically, the, the uh, tails will be run through a tailings pipeline down to that uh, filter plant. They'll be filtered on site. Uh, about 84% of the water will be recycled and pumped back up to the uh, process facility. And then the tailings will be uh, dispo deposited here in lifts. And one of the benefits of the dry stack besides water uh, retention is once you'll start building this perimeter, outside perimeter first, and then you can revegetate re it, reclaim it, and stabilize the toe of the facility. And then you'll do progressive reclamation as you raise uh, the dry stack. So um, a lot of the industry is heading this direction. A lot of projects in Brazil, even areas in high rainfall are starting to go towards this dry stack uh, technology. So that's uh, what we've done here with the project. Um, you know, ESG is an important aspect of the project and, and all of the environmental social work we were basically doing from the beginning in 2014 and continuing it. But when you look specifically at the project um, and our management practices, basically we aim to prevent and minimize several of uh, impact areas. One real benefit of the project is a uh, majority of the power is uh, renewable. It's from hydroelectric uh, in the national grid. We're, pro as we mentioned earlier, we're close to the port of uh, Bolivar, so transportation, less emissions, less, uh, less uh, sort of impacts in the social area versus saying having to truck concentrates all the way across the country. Um, I already mentioned the recycle of tailings water. Um, basically, you eliminate any sort of ca carbon emissions you might get with the convention, conventional tailings pond. Uh, ponds that you would have there and, and additives to uh, 
to keep the pH and such under control. No acid rock drainage condition in either the tails or the waste rock. We've done a lot of testing on this over several years, so we're in good shape there. A uh, portion of the uh, conveying system, the ore conveying system will be an aerial conveyor, which uh, is up on, uh, it's a bit like a ski lift where you, you have uh, towers. So you have minimum ground uh, clearance impacts from that. And I mentioned the progressive uh, tailings and waste rock uh, reclamation, but also the area is all second growth timber up there. And there a lot of land has been cleared by previous uh, landowners um, for cattle grazing and some agriculture. So we're able to um, do a lot of reclamation work and revegetation work in, in those areas as offset to potential disturbances. And we've done quite a bit of it already. I think we've planted over 30,000 trees in a lot of these areas and done a lot of habitat restoration work. We have a robust social license to operate. We built that over our whole period of time since we've been in the project in 2014, good relations with neighbors. None of the communities in the area are indigenous communities. Uh, we operate in LRO province, which has a mining history. Um, albeit there's ongoing mining and there has been for quite a long time. This will be, uh, you know, a larger, largest project in the area. And uh, we're guided by corporate policies and best management practices. And a lot of the design for the project has been the international standards, best management practices, IFC guidelines, that sort of stuff. And then, you know, just looking at the permitting timeline here. So we've completed the pre-feasibility study. The next, there are two next steps that will lead to the ultimate uh, permit and the EIA. First, we'll go to the government. We have an exploration, exploitation investment agreement because there's no bilateral uh, trade agreement between Canada and the U.S. And we're going to amend that for an exp exploitation investment protection agreement. And basically, you go to the government and negotiate a term sheet of all the royalty rates, tax rates, import duties, all those sort of things. And uh, we'll do that. Uh, we're gonna, we plan to submit our application next week or two. And then within the next month, I'm, I'll be down there working with the ministry to negotiate the final terms. Now that we've got the project uh, uh, nailed down as far as infrastructure and all, our operating plan, we we're developing, we'll develop that and then continue to do baseline env environmental monitoring. We'll have to expand that a little bit to uh, take in the new configuration of the project. But that baseline work and the plan of operations will get you to where you can do an environmental impact statement and you can start looking at um, alternatives, siting alternatives, impact analysis, mitigation plans. So that'll be ongoing in parallel with the uh, feasibility study. And in the end, after you have the environmental impact assessment and you have public hearings, um, and that all goes well. You'll be issued an environmental license. And the same ministry, the Ministry of Environment, um, deals with the environmental license. And then the second thing you'll need is an industrial water use permit. So that'll go in line. So once you have your EIA, your investment protection agreement, you go to the Ministry of, uh, the minist ministry of Mines and en Energy and Mines, and you get the operating permit. So... We think that'll take us into uh, 2025, sort of mid-year, and then it's a 2.5 year build uh, for completion of the project. Scott, over to you on this. Yeah, sure. So just, uh, you know, a little bit of updated benchmarking for people. And, you know, this is kind of every project out there that can produce over 250,000 ounces a year of gold. So, you know, Cagreos is, is the fifth largest that's independently held. You know, you can see the green check marks there on some of them. These are ones that are currently getting constructed. So, I mean, we think we're in kind of that sweet spot of production capacity um, versus CapEx trade-off for things that are actually getting built right now. Um, and, you know, obviously not a lot of these projects out there for when majors are looking to, for reserve replacement, um, you know, as they, as they look to find these large-scale projects. 
Um, you know, this is this is a pretty key uh, component. Some of you might have seen this slide before. We've updated it, obviously, for the new numbers a little bit, but it doesn't really change the takeaway, which is that, you know, of all these large scale milling projects um, and a lot of these you'd be familiar with, um, we're the lowest grade. But when you adjust for the strip ratio that we talked about, you know, we go from the worst in the set to the second best in the set. And that really speaks to the operating costs and, you know, how much waste you need to move to get at a ton of ore. Uh, so some of these projects say in Ontario would be, you know, over a gram per ton, but they have to move four tons of material to get at one ton of ore. Whereas we're basically, you know, closer to one to one on that ratio. And, and that really can impact the project uh, economics. So something to keep in mind. You know, the, the last thing here is is really just, you know, whether you're new to the story or whether you've been here for a while, you know, we think this is uh, a little bit out of whack. And, and obviously the company's made a lot of progress uh, over this time period. And, you know, we started out with 4 million ounces in, in 2017. Since then, our market cap is only up, you know, 5% despite uh, gold being up 67%, copper being up 50%, and our resource being up 400%. And a lot of the feedback we got over the last year or two was really around, you know, the unknown question mark of what was going to happen with the CapEx. And, uh, and we've obviously done a lot of work with the phasing uh, and the PFS study to try to keep that number basically flat, uh, which is what we've achieved here. So we're hoping that with the removal of that question mark and, and a further increase in the resource size, and now obviously de-risking with reserves, um, you know, this will start to correct a little bit because obviously uh, we think we've added a lot of value to the project over that period of time. Um, you know, as Marshall said, we've got a pretty robust uh, social program in the area. Not a lot of people around the project, but, you know, for the people that are uh, in the neighboring communities, you know, we're working on business programs. Uh, we're working on um, greenhouses in the communities um, to support themselves and also for sales. And we're working on reforestation in and around the project, you know, away from our deposit areas. Um, so, you know, it's a it's a fairly robust program that's been, uh, you know, in operation since 2014, since when we took over management. So maybe with that, I'll summarize and just say, um, you know, since we took it on 2014, it's kind of gone from zero resource to the 26th largest project in the world. Um, we've consolidated the concession packages. We've brought in the second head at Grand Bestia. Um, we've obviously done three economic studies now, created a reserve of 11.6 million ounces with a 26 year mine life, you know, shown $2.2 billion of value at 1650 gold for the project. Um, and, you know, we're a management team that's, that's sold a lot of companies over the years. Um, we've sold eight companies for a cumulative $1.6 billion of value. Uh, we think we know how to de-risk these things. And uh, we'll keep driving Lumina forward and uh, look to have a good outcome for shareholders in the, in the near and medium term. So with that, maybe I'll pass over and back to Tim for any questions that people might have. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Marshall and Scott, for the informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. A reminder to everyone on the line that you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. Uh, we already do have a, a few questions. Um, one here looking at the political side of things. Uh, can you uh, address a little more about Ecuadorian politics and, uh, you know, especially if Lasso uh, doesn't get reelected? <laughs> yeah, it's been uh, it's been pretty fluid. Let's go back to when Lasso got elected. Um, basically, he's the center right president. He has been a big promoter of economic growth in Ecuador and mining being one of the four cornerstones. I mentioned earlier that uh, petroleum and then uh, shrimp farming and now mining and that is in third place and bananas in fourth place for uh, exports. So a lot has come through his administration. Um, basically, with, with the U.S. dollar denominated uh, currency, that helps and, and mining becomes very important in that regard. So there was a lot of opposition. He almost he barely won, actually, and he was up against a, a Pachacutec indigenous uh, candidate that had surprised everybody he got into the second round. So when he got into office, um, the the 
there are two parties that were kind of a opposition parties, the Koreistas who previously were in control and uh, the, the, um, the Nabats party, which is the social Christian party of just translating it into English there. Um, anyway, those two parties uh, have been strong opposition to Lasso. They, they went to the courts and went for a um, impeachment vote and, and the, there were three counts or three allegations and the constitutional court only allowed one. And it had to do with, since Lasso was the president, it wasn't directly his corruption, but there was a reported corruption or alleged corruption with the petroleum transport company. Uh, I think it's called uh, Flopec. And um, so anyway, they've said that he didn't control, you know, his ministries and uh, that's the basis for the impeachment move. Now, the vote's going to be at the end of May. Talking to a lot of people, lots of us out there obviously work in the politics. A lot of people believe that it won't pass Congress. But if you look at the social Christians and you look at um, the uh, Koreistas, they need 92 votes. And between those two groups, they have 70 something, maybe 75. So they need to bring... Pachacutec and some of the minority ones across. So we don't know that that'll happen. So worst case, if that happens, then you'll have um, Barrero, Barrero um, his uh, vice president, would assume the presidency if the impeachment goes through. But Lasso, if the impeachment goes through, has the ability through what they call the Muerte Cruzado, the death cross, to dissolve Congress if that happened, um, you know, they would have uh, election in, you know, sort of four months or so, five months after that, and he would rule by executive order. Now, say say all that happens um, and there's election, the strongest party to probably come back in is the Koreista party. But you'll recall, these are the guys that first in 2007, 2009, I guess, actually, shut down the mining concession system and kind of wiped out mining in the country for a while. But they are also the same guys that brought it back in 2014 to 16. So in that worst case scenario, if the Koreistas come back into power, at least the worst case for Lasso, uh, if the Koreistas come back into power, I think they would continue um, seeing mining as an important uh, sector in the economy and continue to move it forward. So I think Overall, no matter what happens, I think mining is going to continue to be a part, important part of the economy. It's kind of a long-winded answer, but it's a complicated question. Great. Thank you. Um, kind of shifting here to the environmental side, we have a question that uh, says, obviously, you have a, you've done some work on the environmental profile with hydropower and, and dry stack tailings. Um, have you done any work calculating the carbon footprint on the on the project? Obviously, that's been kind of a hot topic um, in recently with uh, the mining industry. Yeah, we we've looked at that a little bit, and um, we we have a, a general feel for it. I don't have any numbers to put out for you, but we looked at it. You know, can you go in and calculate this per ounce of production and and all these sort of things? So. Right now, I would say we're, we're working on that, but I don't have a figure for you. It, it would be on the, you know, it would be on the lower side of the industry, given that the majority of the power is coming from from hydro and the transport costs are so low. Um, but, you know, it's still it's still a diesel fleet. So there's still emissions for sure. Sure. One question here that's always popular uh, with uh, with Lumina Gold is, are you looking to basically looking to sell the company? And if so, when, you know, is there a process and when might we look forward to news on that front? Yeah, so there's no there's no formal process right now. You know, we're just kind of talking to people as as people approach us. And, and obviously, I think this PFS is a is a catalyst to re-engage with a lot of people um, on the back of fresh numbers. Like I said in the presentation, you know, I think there was a lot of, of question marks around what would happen with the capital and the operating costs during this inflationary period. And, you know, hopefully we've been able to demonstrate um, with a good amount of detail um, 
that you know that that it's not uh, not going to materially change the project. So um, yeah, we're definitely you know reengaging with people, and and obviously our largest shareholder is is fairly vocal about uh, you know wanting to sell the company, and that's the strategy. Uh, but unfortunately, no, I can't really give any guidance on on when something like that would materialize. Great. Uh, kind of following up on something you mentioned there with the the capex. Um, only slightly higher than than in the 2020 PEA, uh, in spite of the inflationary environment. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the inputs there, um, kind of things that you did to, to help keep that uh, modest, I guess? Yeah, so I, I think the first thing is in the 2020 PEA, we had a, a process plant and overall project built on 40,000 ton per day, initial throughput for the first five years. What we've done now is we've gone to 40,000 tons per day. We've gone down to 30,000 tons per day uh, throughput in the PFS. So, you know, that's about a 25% reduction in throughput. So we've also gone in and we've eliminated part of, you know, for instance, the molybdenum circuit we've taken out. We'll study that more in the um, feasibility study. The saprolite saprock portion of the process we've taken out. So we'll study that more as well. Um, we've gone to um, a, a minor lease own mining fleet or an operator lease own mining fleet. So with that, you know, we're looking at sort of 20% down for the equipment and then you continue to finance that through the first seven years. And then after that, we would buy any equipment that's needed and rebuild, you know, the mining fleet as we advance, you know, into the 20 year sort of time frame. So those sort of things all add up. We did, um, we did hit close to the peak in, in of the inflationary period, sort of started estimating and looking at this sort of five, six months ago, and, and finally went out to Vendor quotes, we had 12 major uh, equipment packages for mechanical equipment. And then we had the mining fleet we went out for a quote on. And then um, electrical packages, we had eight of those. So I think we have a very current uh, capital cost uh, estimate right now. And a lot of that has to do with keeping the, the CapEx flat, has to do with the reduction of the throughput. But the interesting thing about that was in the PEA, for the first five years, we went to 40,000, then we went to 80,000. In the PFS, we moved uh, the first three years 30, four through uh, six is 60,000 tons per day. So basically we ended up more or less with the same uh, NPV for those two scenarios. So that'll be two lines. And then to get to 80,000 tons per day in year seven, we just expand those two lines. So that, that um, that helped quite a bit as well. Great. Um, and looking at operating costs, uh, can you tell us a little bit? Um, obviously, it seems like there's always some cost creep uh, a little bit as projects advance. Um, can you tell us anything that's influencing that um, and maybe some, some areas where you've kept that uh, kind of controlled? Yeah, so one of the one of the interesting things in Ecuador, and, and these are two inputs to OPEX costs that are pretty important. First of all, it's an oil producer, so they produce uh, they produce diesel. They don't uh, have a, a high tax. Um, there is a, a VAT tax, but it's refundable. So you don't have like in North America where you have layers of taxes for states and provinces. So. What we did there is, is uh, go back and look at through the last, I guess, about 18 months, more or less. We looked at the price for diesel in the country versus the long term oil prices over that period of time and did a, a regression analysis and, and came up with roughly 60 cents a liter for uh, diesel price. Today, I think it's 71 cents a liter is what it is now. So we looked, took the long term view of that regression analysis. And then the other thing that power is very stable and low cost in the country. And um, that was about, I think in the PEA, it was 6.2, 6.3 cents a kilowatt hour. 
it's 6.8 now, so you don't have a lot of inflation there. Then if you look at labor in Ecuador, um, Ecuador through you know the whole COVID period, because it's dollar denominated and it has this low energy and, and low fuel prices, they only experienced about a 3.6% inflation in the country. So you didn't have a lot of labor inflation also. So those things kind of help on the OPEX. Now, if you go and look at the mining OPEX, the overall mining OPEX is probably up close to, um, probably close to 15 to 20% versus the PEA. Um, if you look at processing, it's probably up in that same sort of range. So we did see OPEX move up on us. And along a different vein here, um, obviously you had some uh, success in your drilling programs, uh, expanding Grand Bestia especially. Um, do you plan to conduct any more drilling? Is that in the plans going forward or is it really focused on development from here? It's focused on development, but there's upside as we pointed out in the presentation at Grand Bestia, to the north, northwest, at Congreos to the, to the southwest and both deposits are open at depth. So really going forward towards a feasibility study, basically what you do is you would go into the mine plan um, and at least the first uh, three years of production, you'd want to upgrade the resource confidence from, uh, from indicated to measured and then convert it to a, a indicated to measured and then convert it to a proven reserve. So that would be the focus of it. You'd also go in and do drilling uh, related to final pit slope work. So, so you'd have a, a, a program there, geotech pit slope program. But the intent, I think right now with 11 and a half million ounces and 1.5 billion pounds of copper in the mine plan, I think we're in pretty good shape. So that would probably be the basis going forward with the feasibility study. One question on a different vein here, um, mentions Rio Tinto's Newton technology uh, for copper deposits is making progress. Are there any new technologies uh, that you see that might help improve extraction um, with, uh, with the type of ore that you have? No, I think we've gone through and looked at kind of what, what's available right now. I know that um, Rio's done that in, in several recent projects. I think Regulus in Peru was one of those projects recently they did a deal on. But um, basically, the, the things that we can do, there's the ability on the gold side to improve recoveries a bit more. Like in the filter plant with a lot of the MET test work we did, we used a, a screening for the um, concentrates the, the that would go to the be reground. So that'd be the rougher concentrate and uh, cleaner scavenger concentrate. So you could go to cyclones and we may be able to get sort of one to 2% increase in gold recoveries overall. So that's the kind of thing. And then I think um, the other area is we had in the 2020 PEA, the saprolite and saprock, and there's about 17 million tons of sort of point, roughly 0.7 material. We didn't do enough uh, work on the material handling is like can in the current flow sheet, can you get it up to the plant without bottlenecking the rest of the operation? So we're, we would look at the feasibility study in a second small plant that could deal with the sap, sap rock. And you could actually um, relocate it in a new tailings area, a conventional tailings area, or potentially add it to the existing dry stack. We did test the material up to 7% saprolite material and the dry stack handled that fine. So, you know, we would have to look at that and um, that's a potential other upside that um, there's less technology, but it's, it's more engineering and material handling wise. Sure. Uh, one question that I that I missed here, but kind of a follow on to when we were talking about uh, potential sale of the company. But how many NDAs uh, groups have you have you had signed? Or well, we haven't been in a beauty contest to get NDAs signed, but but we do have some in place. <laughs> all right, all right, great. Well, I think uh, that's all. Anything to that? 
no, no. <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, the only thing we didn't really touch on here and, and maybe make it obvious to people is valuation, which is, you know, we're trading at a $200 million Canadian market cap on a $2.2 billion MPV. And, you know, I, I think that should be fairly obvious to hopefully most of the listeners why that's uh, why that's got some upside in it. Yeah, it's a point point one PNAV price to net asset value ratio. Yeah, great. And I guess one other question I would ask we we had chatted about it, but kind of for for the folks out there. But looking at um, at that valuation, the sensitivities. What is about the value the the NPV and maybe IRR at uh, at current spot prices? Yeah, it's it's about three point five billion US on the MPV and um, and about twenty three percent IRR there. Great, great, great. Well, uh, just to review, I guess, um, kind of uh, generally, uh, what news might we expect to have over the coming weeks and months from Luminum? Yeah, I mean, I think people should expect some news this year on the investment protection agreement front and terms. And, you know, I think that that is kind of the next logical uh, public de-risking item for, for people. And then, um, you know, stay tuned on any other corporate development events. Great. Well, with that, I'd like to, again, thank Marshall Koval and Scott Hicks for presenting today. And thank you, everyone uh, out there for tuning in. Uh, just a reminder, Red Cloud Securities will be back Monday afternoon when our webinar series continues with Basin Uranium presenting Monday, April 24th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks a lot, Tim. Thanks for everybody for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thank you.